We're going to be talking about virtual reality guidance and augmented reality guidance for surgery and, and whether there's any evidence to support this stuff and kind of what qualifies as augmented reality. So just a bit of an introduction. Um, uh, the, how can I get this to display here? Um, Neurosurgery is a pretty young field. Uh, the first case known in history of a cerebral tumor was 1885. Um, this is the first case in history uh, that was published, at least that we know of. Uh, it, this was a 25-year-old male that presented with paralysis of the left uh, hand and arm. Uh, and before any imaging modalities, uh, you know, no CT or MRI, they knew based on animal models that a tumor, that weakness of the left hand and arm correlated to the central part of the precentral gyrus. Uh, so they were localized it entirely based on symptoms. Um, and uh, he also had seizures seizures, headaches, uh, nausea and vomiting, uh, and papilledema, which we know now as, as signs of increased intracranial pressure. Um, the, uh, the diagnosis at the time was as a, an encephalic growth um, at the center aspect of the, of the fissure of Orlando. Um, using surface landmarks at the time, uh, they were able to basically knock three small holes in the skull uh, and uh, found a swollen brain and a growth coming out. Uh, and this is kind of what their craniotomy looked like. Um, th this is, uh, I describe this as not uh, augmented or virtual reality, but this is reality. This is without any augmentation at all. This is how they did it uh, 135 years ago. This is the first case, but they were actually able to accurately localize where the tumor was um, and resect it. Uh, they noted that the patient initially recovered well with no new, new neurological deficits. Uh, the papilledema improved, uh, but about a month later, the patient ended up dying uh, from meningitis because, of course, this is before either antiseptic technique or antibiotics uh, had been developed. Uh, but the important thing about this was that uh, it was well tolerated by the patient. They were able to remove the tumor, uh, and they concluded that eventually, uh, with better surgical technique, with antiseptic and antibiotic techniques, the, uh, the outcomes might have been dramatically different. Um, so kind of fast forward 125 years, I, this is like the tongue-in-cheek modern era of neurosurgery. Uh, because this is, you know, a lot of uh, way way you see craniotomies done across the country. This is a patient uh, that had a, a bifrontal craniotomy for a craniopharyngioma, uh, and then ended up having their bone flap necrose and having to, and get infected and having to take it out. So uh, this is imprecise neurosurgery or b before precision neurosurgery. Um, what, what the way that they were doing things and still are doing th things in many places. Um, one of the things I'm involved with is is developing new techniques and technology uh, for minimally invasive approaches to surgery. That includes both virtual reality rehearsal and augmented reality guidance for surgery. So uh, we uh, live in an era where we've been kind of blessed by many technical and technological advances, which kind of help to make this easier. Interoperative navigation, of course, has made a huge uh, difference. Uh, but even at navigation in its era, when it was introduced, you had the guys say, you know, I don't need navigation. I just kind of put my hand here. And this is like, I know it's this distance down my thumb. You know, sure, that kind of works. But you have to make a big open craniotomy to do it, you know. And so we now know wh what they knew then, that w even without evidence to support it, that patients that have navigation-based surgery are going to have, you know, more precise craniotomies, smaller craniotomies, less invasive approaches, and probably have better outcomes. We knew that was going to be the case before it actually was developed and demonstrated uh, by, by trials. Uh, the advances in, in imaging technology, we've talked about some of them today, the tractography, the ability just to see the, the white matter pathways as well as uh, functional pathways, uh, refined instrumentation, as, as Zach talked about earlier, the ability to, now that we can make smaller openings, operate through these smaller openings, has been the work, iterative work of, of many of our colleagues. Uh, and this is is all necessary in order to advance the field forward. Doppler vessel probe is a form of, in my mind, augmented reality. To be able to, to, be able to hear what you can't see, putting the vessel probe down there and listen to and find important arteries so you don't cut them, augments our ability beyond the, the, the standard uh, to, to visualize it and to deal with the, the, the field in front of us. And of course, endoscopy. Uh, while endoscopy isn't technically augmented reality, the enhanced visualization that's provided by it, uh, by the increasing uh, Im improvement in camera technology, I mean, look at these vessels on the surface of the chiasm, they're like a tenth of a millimeter in diameter, and you can see them very clearly. Well, being able to see the structures is the first step in being able to protect them, uh, and that's why we're kind of getting towards with, with the, the development of augmented reality. So um, this has been aided by it, the very rapid deployment of, you know, going from 480p in the lower left there to now 4K camera technology, and even still, the 4K appears a little bit pixelated on this big screen, so we have 
have a ways to go there before it's it's going to be optimal, I think, for surgery. But uh, we're getting there, and 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 th these advances are allowing us to perform the surgery uh, more invasively, uh, excuse me, more effectively and less invasively. So this has kind of led to this concept of keyhole neurosurgery, uh, doing the same operations through smaller and smaller approaches, uh, with the idea that you know we used to kind of be like, well, I'm a neurosurgeon, I, you know, I'm going to get in there. It doesn't matter what I do on the way in. I just got to get the tumor out. And now we know that the more we respect natural 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 tissues, for example, the skin as the largest immune organ in the body, the more we the less we interrupt those things, the less likely the patient is to have an infection, the less post-operative pain they're going to have. So using any tools and techniques we have available at our, at our disposal to uh, minimize the, uh, the invasiveness of the procedure, uh, in my mind, is a worthwhile effort. Uh, so navigation technology in these ways has also advanced. And you kind of look at these two images, and we get used to looking at these black and white, you know, two-dimensional, what I describe to patients as this is kind of a Rorschach test on the left side of the screen. You know, I mean, if you, unless you're a surgeon or a radiologist, you look at that and you're like, yeah, what is that? Where my five-year-old looks at the image on the right and like, yeah, dada, I want the green thing. If you, if I get that, you're going to take it out, right? So it becomes much more intuitive. Our ability to, you know, we've always been forced as surgeons to look at images through the radiologist's point of view because the radiologists give us the images in, in axial, coronal, and and sagittal planes, and we're forced to then interpolate those images back into a 3D model in our mind, uh, and that interpolation process is relatively error prone. And I believe my belief is that that's where VR and AR can really uh, improve our understanding uh, of the surgical field before surgery, and then also improve our understanding of what we're seeing in front of us at the time of surgery. So. Just a little bit of an introduction to, for those of you guys that are new to this, um, mediated reality technologies are essentially broken into two main groups. Uh, virtual reality is an entirely computer-generated world. So uh, you put on a, a VR headset, and you have a 3D, 360 degree view of whatever world you're living in, whether it's you know you want to be in a fighter jet, or sitting on the beach somewhere, or inside someone's brain. Uh, this is com totally computer simulated. So obviously, it cannot be used at the time of surgery. So VR uh, is useful before surgery. Uh, for surgical planning and rehearsal. It's useful for resident and fellow education. Uh, and m one of the most important areas we found that is useful for patient education and engagement. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, by contrast, augmented reality um, is a live, direct view of the physical world, which then is enhanced or augmented by any digital input. So the most common example that we have of augmented reality in our world is a GPS navigation in your car. You're driving along in your car, and your ability to find where you are on a street is given to you by a computer screen that's connected with the GPS that's telling the based on satellite triangulation it's telling you where you are so that's Improving or augmenting your ability to understand the world around you that can also be you know um, a, a, a signal sound on a stoplight you know so the, somebody that's blind getting ready to cross the street. They hear the buzz. They know it's okay to cross the street. That's augmented reality. Their, their ability to live safely in the world around them is added to by, by digital input. Um, graphics data, GPS data, this can all be useful uh, to uh, improve our ability to perform, in this case, surgery more safely. So um, we're going to talk about the different areas in which uh, virtual reality and augmented reality can be integrated into the patient care continuum. And the first of them, and kind of the most obvious, is uh, for surgical planning and rehearsal. Um, this is, uh, I'm showing a case here where the preoperative VR rehearsal was actually used to change the surgical plan. So this is a patient with a, a, a right-sided medial sphenoid wing or clinoidal meningioma, which I did the morning of surgery. I had planned a superorbital craniotomy. And in the, in the initial VR fly-through here, I was kind of looking at the tumor here. I'm saying, OK, the tumor's in green. You got the optic nerve in blue. And the original corridor I'm looking at, I say, OK, I'm going to be able to get to this. But then when I kind of fly around a little bit, you can see that there's a little tongue of tumor down back there through the superorbital fissure that I didn't actually noticed that I wasn't going to be able to get to through the superorbital approach. In other words, it gave me the operative corridor, and I realized from the VR rehearsal that the operative corridor from the, the, the superorbital was insufficient. So instead of making that mistake on a patient, I did a VR fly-through of a mini terional craniotomy, and I said, OK, now, coming from the side, I'm rehearsing the operation. Now this is take two at this surgery. And now I get a direct access from the side looking at this tumor, both above and below the sphenoid wing. Now, you could argue that a more experienced surgeon would have known that, OK, superorbital is not going to be able to get this little tongue behind the sphenoid wing. But we're not all Mitch Berger. Not everybody wakes up, rolls up out of bed, and has done you know thousands of cases. So the advantage for this one particular patient
situation, for example, saved me from doing a suboptimal approach and allowed me to, instead of doing a, a superorbital craniotomy where I didn't get the whole tumor out, it allowed me to rehearse the operation, change my plan, review that with the patient, and then do the optimal operation, resect the whole tumor. Now, this guy happened to be an artist. He was losing vision in his right eye, uh, and he painted this amazing four by six canvas for me that sits on my wall now because he's like, you know, you didn't just stick with what your plan. You had the courage to come and tell me I was wrong. I'm going to change my plan. This is what I'm going to do. And so the patient really appreciated that. Um, and so, uh, you know, in that one patient, again, it saved me from doing a suboptimal operation. This has actually been studied uh, both before, you know, with and without virtual reality. So, and this is a study that was done by uh, Johnny Delashaw, which shows that uh, the concept of a superorbital craniotomy or keyhole craniotomy, and they did all these mathematical calculations on cadaver skulls to basically you know, d develop these undulating triangles of, of line of sight, where they're trying to predict line of sight based on the location of a smaller and smaller craniotomy. This is one of the advantages that virtual reality rehearsal allows us to do, is instead of trying to predict that based on mathematical calculations of triangles, Angles, it allows us to try it out. Is this going to work for, for a patient or not? Am I going to be able to see what I need to see and get there? with? Because if, if you don't have a direct line of sight, OK, maybe you can work with a bit of an angled endoscope over the edge. But it, this allows you to see that before you actually get in there. So it gives you this kind of deja vu feeling uh, when you get in there at the time of surgery. Again, this has been studied um, using several different VR systems going back to 2008. Um, in this case, uh, there was a, a 106 cases that were planned using a, a VR system. At, the, at this time, it was a, something called a dextroscope, which is basically these prism-based glasses which reflect the image uh, into your eyes. It was kind of an older version of virtual reality. Uh, and based on that, VR at the time, VR rehearsal, 23% of the time, the virtual reality rehearsal led to a change in the surgical plan. And that's put another way, nearly a quarter of the time, these are experienced surgeons, nearly a quarter of the time, the plan that they made based on the 2D DICOM imaging was incorrect or suboptimal for the patient. And when they did the VR rehearsal, they adjusted it. Sometimes as big of an adjustment as going from an eyebrow to a terional. Other times, you know, maybe a shift, a little bit superior, a little bit lateral. Because you remember, when we're planning these operations, we've got these kind of print or you know, several cookie cutter, OK, I do a terional or I do a, a superorbital, but they're really not tailored to the individual patient anatomy. When we do a, a VR rehearsal, we can tailor it. I'm going to shift the, the, the craniotomy up by a centimeter and to the left because this patient's got a bigger frontal sinus than they normally have. So it, these rehearsals allow us to tailor the patient's specific, the, the craniotomy specifically to each individual patient. This actually data has been replicated. Um, so another study uh, two years ago uh, at Mount Sinai in New York looked at this again and found very similar, surprisingly very similar information uh, that the 3D VR rehearsal led to a change in the surgical plan 24% of the time. So 10 years later, or eight years later, uh, different system, but uh, the same outcome that using virtual reality rehearsal le leads to a, an improved, revised, more precise surgical plan uh, as compared to uh, planning based on, on 2D uh, DICOM images. So that's great for us. I mean, I, and I, we've started using it uh, for preoperative planning. What we kind of stumbled upon, the patient, you know, we started kind of showing the patients this and telling them, you know, uh, yeah, we do this VR fly through, and the patients are like, well, can I see? Like, you know, I want to, I want to see inside my own brain. So we kind of started to use it in that way, and so. Um, we stumbled upon this idea that patients, if we think it's you know kind of a little bit uh, of a challenge to look at axial images and then construct a 3D model, you can imagine how different it is, difficult it is for patients to look at a black and white image and imagine, well, okay, I don't really understand why you're going through my nose or my eyebrow. Whereas when we build a 3D model, again, and show them, it's so, so much more intuitive looking at, OK, this is obvious this is the skull. These are obvious, the, the vascular pattern. OK, I see that this is underneath the frontal lobe and why you have to go through my forehead to get to it. So we started studying this as well. Uh, it was a three-year longitudinal study that we performed at Hogue. Um, the first year uh, prior to VR implementation, so no, you know, patients just had the standard consultations. Second year, we used library cases, so these index cases. Well, this case we're going to be doing on you is kind of similar to a case I did last month. We'd show them a VR fly through of a similar case. Uh, and then the third year, using patient specific uh, reconstruction. So the patients are brought in uh, and they have their own VR fly through of what their model is going to look like. So this is the data uh, of our own patient engagement data, patient retention data. So prior to VR implementation, we were retaining about 64% of our patients. So every 100 patients I recommended surgery to, 64% of them stayed with me. 
The next year, with using indexed or library cases, 82% retention, so a significant improvement in the decrease in patient outmigration. And when they get their individualized, this is their own brain, specifically tailored surgery for them, we're only losing 4% of our patients. Now, this is in an environment where USC, UCLA, and Cedars Sinai are within a one hour drive of our institution. And because of, they still shop, they still drive up to UCLA, they still drive up to Cedars, but they come back because they go there and they have, they're looking at the 2D images and they're like, okay, why don't you guys have this? Like, why are you not using virtual reality? If it's my brain, I want somebody rehearsing the surgery before. If it's my kid's brain, I want someone rehearsing the surgery before. So we've seen patients vote with their feet and when they have this VR fly-through experience, they are, you know, substantially more likely to stay at our institution. So it gives a competitive edge uh, in a competitive marketplace uh, for engaging patients. And we studied this as well by asking the patients subjectively. So before and after their VR fly through, so the orange line is after, and 80% of patients are, are saying that they are 10 out of 10, their level of understanding of, of what their brain tumor surgery is. Now, if you ask around people that have had, you know, consented patients over a number of years for brain tumor surgery, what percentage of their patients would say that they have a 10 out of 10 level of understanding? Understanding, it is not nearly 80%. Our own data, you know, we, we had, what is it, you know, 17% of them were saying is 10 out of 10 using standard consult techniques. So, I, I, again, a huge difference in the patient's level of understanding. The important thing here is that when patients have a better understanding of their own healthcare, of their own disease process, they feel like a member of the team. And it's kind of odd because I, I, it's hard to describe. I, I mean, I had the lady the other day that I did this and she's like, all right, I, I'm, this is awesome. I'm excited. Let's get it out. Like, she almost felt excited because we used the technology to get, improve their level of understanding, to get to truly informed consent uh, with, with the procedure, as well as um, to technologically distract them from what is often a terrible diagnosis. So they're getting a diagnosis of a brain tumor. They're afraid, uh, but taking away the fear of the unknown by improving their level of understanding makes a significant difference for the patients uh, and, and, and for us as well. Again, this is HCAP scores, uh, so we are all rated and ranked based on HCAP scores here. National average HCAP score, uh, 73% for patients who gave their hospital an, a rating of 9 or 10, uh, and 72% for they would definitely recommend. After the VR fly-through, our patients are giving 93% uh, on, on 9 or 10 out of 10 uh, for their level of understanding uh, and for their uh, rating of the hospital. So again, um, this is a little different than molecular biology. This is getting to the patient, you know, patient-centered care and getting to their understanding of the disease process. And, and we're affecting that substantially uh, by using the VR uh, to help the patients uh, understand their disease and the planned surgery. So it, it, for anybody that thinks this is just hype, uh, Forbes uh, rates virtual reality technology as the number one technology for patient experience in healthcare. Forbes isn't in the business of medicine, they're in the business of business, uh, but they understand that, uh, that VR is huge. Uh, and we're gonna show a little bit more data at the end about, about you know, how that makes a difference and where AR stands on that curve as well. So um, to transition the talk uh, into augmented reality, we talk about what qualifies as augmented reality. Uh, and some of these things have been uh, kind of uh, brought up already today. Um, the intraoperative navigation by itself qualifies as augmented reality because it allows us to, it augments our ability to understand where we are uh, in the brain. Um, intraoperative ultrasound, I also uh, put into that same category. It's an imaging modality, but uh, it allows us to see when there's residual residual tumor there. It allows us to, once we've closed the dura, see if there's an intraoperative or postoperative hemorrhage there. So we open the dura back up and stop the bleeding. It allows us to uh, tell us when, okay, yeah, we've gotten that rim of even sometimes non-contrast enhancing tumor, and there's good data to support that. Intraoperative neuromonitoring, the NIM probe, is, is, is a form of augmented reality, because when we're getting close to the facial nerve and we're stimulating, we're hearing a beeping, and, and it, it's giving us auditory feedback that tells us we're close to a danger area. You know, don't use the CUSA here. Don't use the sonopet here, you know, slow down, you're getting close to a critical structure, which is what we want to know. That's all of this is getting at uh, it working towards the goal of increasing the chances of achieving maximal safe resection. A lot of the talks to get today have focused on that, and Sean did a great job of talking about the tumor fluorescence and what the goals of surgery are. But the goals of surgery are always to achieve maximal safe resection. Now, the, you know, the term maximal may be 
debated. And in some cases, it may be just the contrast enhancing portion. In some cases, it may be beyond to include the non-contrast enhancing portion. It may, may be the fluorescent portion. But the goal is to get the entire tumor out without harming the patient. So these things can help us in both telling us where the rest of the tumor is and how far we have to go until we think we've gotten the whole thing, as well as tell us where the critical structures that we want to stay away from are. So it tells us, you know, like a, like a, you know, a advanced, you know, imaging for a fighter pilot, it tells us, you know, where the good guys are and where the enemies are. So um, it, it gives us in a very, um, sometimes very accurate way uh, where this information uh, can be used to, to help the, and guide the resection. So um, just to talk briefly about some of these things, I know they've been reviewed in some of the other talks, and I don't want to belabor the point, but uh, you know, intraoperative ultrasound is a great form of augmented reality because we can we look at the brain surface, it looks normal, but then with the ultrasound nowadays, I mean, you look at it, and this is very obvious where the tumor is as compared to the brain surface. You can very clearly see these are the sulci. You can, in this case, you can't, but a lot of these you can see where the ventricle is, where the vessels are. You can turn on the Doppler color flow in these and identify where vessels are flowing through the tumor. So intraoperative ultrasound, in my mind, is a form of augmented reality. Uh, and it's uh, somewhat user dependent. The more you use it, the more you get used to looking at it, the better you, you get at it. But it augments our ability to safely achieve maximal resection uh, while trying to avoid uh, injuring the, the surrounding normal brain. You, I mean, it's very obvious you know, where the normal brain is in, in these just, um, in these images, you know, it does get, you know, you have the same problem you have with MRI, you know, where, where you get edema at the edge of the tumor and it's it, okay on ultrasound, edema or infiltrative tumor can look the same. But when it's solid lobulated tumor like that, the ultrasound very clearly helps you to be able to visualize it. Um, again, intraoperative neuromonitoring, uh, phase reversal for identification of the motor strip. If I look at the motor strip, unless I've got a wide open craniotomy and can see, okay, this is the central sulcus, I don't know that it's the motor strip just by looking at it. There's no fingerprint. On the, on the brain surface that tells me this is motor strip. But I put a grid on there, and it tells me, with pretty good reliability, this is the motor strip, and I don't want to cut into it. Uh, so that's a form of augmented reality. Uh, cortical and subcortical mapping, uh, you know, the same thing. You know, using the stimulator probe to tell me this is a motor pathway, uh, or this is, you know, deep mo white, mo white fiber tracts that go to the motor pathways, uh, augments my ability to know wh wh whether what I'm resecting is safe or not. And then, as we mentioned, the, the cranial nerve monitoring uh, to to give me auditory feedback to tell me, hey, that's the facial nerve. You know, don't don't pull, don't resect that. Um, it's you know, it's telling us very obviously danger zone, danger zone, stay out of there. Sometimes we need it like that. I mean, sometimes I tell them turn the thing up. I want to hear it. I don't want you. I don't want you to you know, kind of maybe interpret it. I want to hear it beeping when I get near the facial nerve because I want to know before I do something harmful. So um, all of these again are augmenting our ability to understand the operative environment in front of us and hopefully, um, you know, providing. Uh, a, a ability to improve the safety of the operation. Again, Sean reviewed the, the, the sodium fluorescein and uh, fluorescence for both fluorescein and ALA, so I don't want to belabor this. Uh, but you know, you can see what looks like relatively, although maybe swollen, normal brain with a little bit of discoloration on the left. Once the fluorescein is given uh, and the yellow 560 filter is turned on, this is augmented reality because I can see where the tumor clearly is underneath the surface of the brain, and I know that this is you know there's only a very thin layer of brain there. Uh, that I need to go through in order to get to the tumor if I can see it with this direct, direct light. Wouldn't be able to be visualized through reality, needs augmentation in order to allow better visualization. Uh, again, the same thing with the Delta 5 ALA, and uh, the differences between these two were discussed very well in the last talk, so I won't go into it, but you can even see here the difference between necrosis, between solid tumor, and kind of that border area, which may be non-contrast enhancing tumor, but you know, it uh, kind of at least tells us you, this is where you want to be. When, when it's starting to transition back towards normal appearing, there's no fluorescence at all, you want to be really thoughtful about whether you're starting to resect that, because the positive predictive value of Delta 5 ALA the value of it is really in the positive predictive value. So if it's lighting up, it's probably tumor. If it's not lighting up, it's you know a lot more questionable. Uh, some some uh, centers advocate dual use of both Delta 5 ALA and sodium fluorescein to again add the two together uh, to improve your ability to visualize these things. Um, 
Is there evidence to support this? Again, it, it, there's a lot of this was discussed in the prior talk, so I'm going to kind of move through this in the interest of time uh, to get everybody out of here at a reasonable time. Uh, is there evidence to support uh, AR and VR uh, in tumor surgery? Um, so the a review of the literature, was just, which was just published this month, actually, um, ser searching the terms virtual reality and augmented reality and intracranial tumors, uh, revealed 2,300 abstracts. Out of that, uh, only 76 of them ended up being reviewed, and only 15 included in the final analysis. Most of them kind of, a lot of them were either not specific to neurosurgery or, um, or you know, they were screened out. Uh, so there was no study, interestingly, no study that focused on both modalities uh, in the, for the usage of intracranial tumor surgery for either surgery planning, performance, or post-surgical assessment. Kind of what that tells us is this is very new, uh, that when, uh, you know, they first started using navigation, again, you had lots of people that were kind of hesitant, you know, I don't need that, How it doesn't really add to my ability, I know where the cranial nerves are, well, yeah, if that were true, we would end up with perfect surgeries where, you know, you could take out acoustics and nobody ever got facial nerve palsies and nobody ever got visual palsies and nobody ever got, you know, uh, olfactory deficits or cranial nerve deficits after surgery. If we all knew based on anatomy where everything was, then we wouldn't need any of this and surgery would be ideal. However, uh, I'm human uh, and most other surgeons that I know are too. And so anything we can use to help to uh, improve our ability to understand where those structures are. Uh, is useful in my mind. So um, of these 15 studies, um, eight studies specifically uh, focused on, on virtual reality for, uh, and, and found it useful for precise surgical planning. So VR, um, as far as surgical planning, uh, allows us to, again, perform a precise craniotomy, uh, which, which allow, you know, can be uh, more accurate uh, in, in, and being smaller and more, more minimally invasive. Uh, seven of the studies uh, focused on AR, and the studies focused on AR are, are kind of, only a few of them are at all in clinical use, and most of them are kind of testing AR-based systems on models uh, and in laboratories. So again, this is all very new technology. Uh, but. Uh, Kind of just to review a little bit about what those found for augmented reality in neurosurgery, uh, there's a few different uh, techniques out there by which to uh, augment. Uh, and when we're talking about augmented reality in this phase, we're putting the fluorescence and ultrasound and intraoperative monitoring and auditory feedback behind us. And we're talking about image projection techniques, about how to project additional digital information onto the, the field of view uh, to allow us to visualize these things. Uh, this is one technique uh, that was published on Journal surgery a couple of years ago, which basically used a, uh, you know, a, an a addition to the navigation wand, which had a digital projector, a pen-like projector, which would project an image onto the surface of the brain. So like a flashlight almost, a smart flashlight, which would show, okay, there's tumor in red. I'm kind of shining it on the surface of the brain. And it knew based on the optical tracking of the navigation wand, kind of where I was pointing at in the surface of the brain. Now, obviously that there's a problem with that because line of sight is an issue um, and it gives you a two-dimensional image projected upon a three-dimensional world. But still, it could be useful for kind of grossly localizing, you know, where a tumor is and where the best place to make a, a craniotomy is. I would argue, you know, it, uh, it, Ultrasound is probably better than uh, this image projection technique uh, for visualizing the surface of the tumor because th this is based on uh, again preoperative uh, MRI and then a moving wand within the within the field of view, projecting a 2D image into a 3D screen. So it doesn't give you information about how deep it is, um, and it doesn't tell you anything about brain shift. And, and we'll get to brain shift at the end because that's kind of still the major challenge uh, in augmented reality uh, to date with with neurosurgery. Uh, so, but this is a, a, a review of that paper. They did 10 cases cases where they kind of have these little green uh, and purple color maps for where the tumors are. The virtual images are created uh, based on the MRI and then again projected using an external projector pen, similar to the projector that's powering this screen, uh, and shined the light or the image of the tumor onto the surface of the brain. Um, they actually found a pretty good registration error in this about, uh, you know, anywhere between two and three millimeters, which is pretty, you know, agreeable with our standard navigation uh, error measurements. Um, it, it, what was difficult about this is it's kind of technically cumbersome, uh, required a separate re-registration for using and placing these separate fiducial markers uh, specifically for this, and again, the challenge of giving a 2D image uh, on a 3D world. But it was helpful in planning the craniotomy. Uh, so that was, uh, that was what they found in that uh, technique. Another technique uh, for augmented reality is something called a transvisible navigator. This is basically uh, a tablet 
an iPad or, or you know, um, HP tablet, which using the camera and then navigating the position of the tablet, they kind of shine it on the on the patient and allow it to visualize, you know, kind of where the critical structures are. So they, they navigate the position of the tablet in reference to the head uh, and gives these kind of, you know, overlays of what the anatomy looks like. It allows you to see these kind of major veins and arteries, allows you to kind of see where the tumor borders are. Um, so this is a tablet and camera-based AR system. Uh, again, though, with the challenge of giving you 2D images uh, in a 3D world, the additional challenge here is that you can't operate with a tablet in your hands or in the way of your surgical field. So um, the, the one area this is potentially, this type of uh, format is potentially useful is uh, that, and that's being looked at is for uh, in, um, ICU procedures such as a placement of ventriculostomy. So you can slide something under the patient that allows you to register it. The tablet's fixed in space and you're basically looking through the tablet uh, and putting the ventric in uh, using augmented reality because you're able to look at the screen and see both the live image in front of you of where the catheter is going as well as the projected view of the ventricles on top of it. Uh, in those cases, brain shift isn't an issue because you're you know just drilling a small hole. So uh, putting the catheter in using this tablet-based AR um, is a reasonable uh, thing to consider. And this is kind of something Medtronic is, is working with uh, right now to, to kind of put, put this out there. But beyond placement of a catheter, I think the, the this tablet-based, camera-based AR system is kind of uh, doesn't have a ton of utility again because you can't uh, use that tablet and operate through it. But it does bring up the concept of what Zach was talking earlier of a totally camera-based system using an endoscope or an exoscope and then having that process, uh, that the image digitally processed to, uh, to uh, uh, augment the, the view that you're seeing. So, um, True AR is what I call true AR is the heads up display. This is what we all think of as augmented reality in the car. It looks like this. Not that you have to look down at your phone to get the uh, information, but that it's projected onto the windshield so that an arrow is telling you turn right here. So that's what I consider to be, you know, we've been talking about all the different modalities of AR, but heads up display for augmented reality uh, is, is how, how I term this. And this, this is called navigation mode. This is what the fighter pilots use when they're getting the information in their one eye. Um, the challenge is the fighter pilots have to actually train to separately interpret that. And I actually went through that training process so that I could learn how to do that uh, with two in separately interpreting a binocular vision. Uh, so this is what the heads up display looks like for an endoscopic case. So I'm gonna show a video here. Expand this a little bit here so we can see. So this is a, uh, a case using heads up AR for, for endoscopy. So this is a pituitary tumor. We gotta go through the standard diacom images first. The interesting thing about this case is it was an area of, of pituitary apoplexy at the top. So it kind of had this cystic cavity, which is well differentiated there, which kind of is useful in, in showing the accuracy of the AR model a bit later on. And we'll kind of show that when we get to that portion of the case. But uh, you know, the standard 2D, now what we're doing is we're tracking the endoscope as if we track a, a navigation instrument. So the, 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 the endoscope is registered as if it were a nav probe. So the position of the endoscope is now tracked in 3D space as compared to the live surgical view. So you got live surgical view on the left and augmented reality on the right. So this is two separate split screen view. You can see on the left a kind of field half full of blood, but on the right I can see a very clear representation of where the tumor is, where the optic nerves are, and where that kind of little tumor capsule extended up. Now you can see what I'm doing is fading in and out for the translucency of the augmented reality to show me kind of where the critical structures are. I've gone ahead and resected the majority of the tumor here, the cellar portion, but I still have that kind of cystic portion up above, extending up between. What I'm seeing here on the left side of the screen is my view of that live view of the cyst, but I can't see the optic nerves. What I can see, though, is where the position of the optic nerves is based on the augmented reality image on the right. So as I fade that in and out, and I'm trying to get the last bits of this tumor out by resecting the inside portions of that cystic portion to make sure there's no tumor, I know where my hand is based on the uh, AR overlay. So it's augmenting my ability to understand where I am in relationship to that. And and this is again just showing the tracking of the uh, of this the um, augmented reality device and truly giving us that heads up display of kind of knowing like knowing like a car navigating knowing where I'm going. So particularly in pituitary surgery where the field gets full of blood, it's one of the most frustrating things you can have. The blood gets on the lens, you got to keep rinsing it. The whole time you have a a view of what you're actually looking at, so you can keep yourself out of trouble. 
Again, the challenge with that is you're looking at two separate screens. So we can't operate based on a screen that's a kind of obstructed with, you know, with additional digital overlay. I don't want to be dissecting with this digital overlay, but I want to know where it is. So I spent about uh, six months uh, with the, the um, electrophysiologist from NASA that trains the astronauts uh, to separately interpret binocular vision. So they have to learn to use a monocle and that feeds them the information about telemetry data and you know, radar data and all that that's fed into the single eyepiece for the astronauts. I spent out six months, three mornings a week. And what they do, the way they do that is called split attention tasks. So basically, there's different numbers and, and signals and things flashing up on different areas of the screen. And during this, they're collecting EEG data from my scalp again, an hour a day, uh, three mornings a week uh, for six months. Uh, and you can see eventually the cohesion between left and right sides and the improvement in the power here. Uh, so this is to start off with, very black, so I'm not getting a lot of cohesion. And on the other side here, starting to really correlate between the ability to separately interpret data from the right and left eye to really be able to use this data. Well, this is, you know, I did that just to see if it was something that could be accomplished, to see if I could really get to the point of having this be useful. Um, but that's not a reasonable thing to have surgeons do. So we need to improve that. We need to get better with, with that. That's an area for growth and challenge that we need to be able to figure out how to intermittently project that into the field of view to tell you where you are without obstructing the field of view or causing inattentional blindness. So uh, that's AR heads-up display for uh, endoscopy. Uh, in addition, we're looking, we're using now AR heads-up display for mic microscopic surgery. So this is a case where we use it. Uh, in this case, we brought in the microscope from the beginning to show the capabilities of the system. So we did the three the three dimensional planning uh, based based on the 3D model pre-op, uh, and we were originally planning an eyebrow craniotomy. But you can see. This, uh, the, the, in purple is the frontal sinus, which in this case was ex fairly extensive. So frontal sinus violation is kind of part of the eyebrow craniotomy, but if you can avoid it, you would rather, because you have a, a higher risk of CSF leak. So instead, we used the virtual model to shift the craniotomy you know, up and to the side a little bit to create a precisely better craniotomy for this patient. And now this is AR tracking. So I'm looking at the live surgical view from the microscope on the left and the augmented reality view on the right. So what I'm seeing, I'm now delineating the superior border of the frontal sinus so that I can exactly place my craniotomy right at the superior aspect of the frontal sinus and get the view that I want to get. I make my craniotomy, keyhole craniotomy, about two by three centimeters there. Uh, and again, I'm seeing what I should be seeing. We introduce the ultrasound to show us, yes, we're looking at the tumor. And now we're starting to take our subfrontal approach down along the inferior aspect of the tumor. So here's the microscopic view on the left and the augmented image on the right showing me tumor in green, optic nerves in blue. And as I dissect underneath the frontal lobe, I fade in and out on the translucency of the tumor so I can see, okay, is, it, is what I'm looking at really tumor? As, as I move around, the virtual image reconstruction tracks along with the position of the microscope. So now that I can see that this is really accurate, like as I fade in and out, you can see the tumor there on, is kind of red on the left side and the green on the right side showing me where the tumor is, where the optic nerves are. In each case, you can decide kind of what are the critical structures you want to highlight or take out. During the case, I'm asking them to fade in and out of the tumor to see, okay, what am I, am I getting up to the back of it? Am I going to be, um, you know, getting towards the optic nerves at some point? So I know that, again, I'm constantly bringing that information in and out of my field. Uh, this is, uh, this, these images are obtained from the video projection from the microscope. So again, the challenge here is that I'm still having to look up uh, from the microscope to see what the screen to see that augmented reality. So even though it's heads up in the, in the aspect that it's showing me kind of side-by-side -side projections, it's still not real time in the workflow that I can just kind of see it with what I'm looking at and continue my operation. But it ended up with a good result. It enabled us to tailor the craniotomy specifically for that patient, avoid the frontal sinus, get a, get a complete resection, and restore the patient's vision. Uh, now, would that have been possible without it? Maybe. You know, we could have used the, the stealth and kind of marked out the borders of the frontal sinus. But having that heads-up display and being able to look at it and say, okay, I'm looking at the three-dimensional representation of the frontal sinus through the microscope, marking it off with the bovi, then making that craniotomy, it just was, it was so much easier because it was intuitive. It wasn't, I was having to interpolate back the images in my mind. It was right there in front of me. The information was readily accessible. 
So uh, both for endoscopic uh, surgery and for microscopic surgery, we're almost there um, for, for augmented reality, for heads-up display augmented reality, but there are still some challenges that remain, and some of these we talked about last night. The big challenge with all of this stuff, particularly relevant for glioma surgery, is brain shift. Uh, it, once the brain shifts away from whatever it is, you know, from the surface of the skull, it, the position is shifted compared to the preoperative imaging, and your registration is no longer accurate. So what you're seeing as tumor may just be empty space now. Uh, and it, the, the brain has shifted back away. I know that there's a couple of companies working on the ability to optically re-register the brain surface. Uh, it, I've not seen that uh, to be truly ready for prime time yet. Um, another challenge is, is the issue, again, we discussed with the heads-up display because the workflow for microscopic surgery now stands that I have to lift my eyes away from the microscope to look at the screen, whether it's a two-dimensional navigation or whether it's the 3D AR view, I still have to look away from the microscope uh, to, to see the, the augmented information. Uh, that's something that's in development as well, to be able to inject it into the eyepiece. I know that um, one of the companies does that now uh, as far as taking the ICG data digitizing that and then reprojecting it back into the image to allow you to see an augmented view of an aneurysm or an AVM. Uh, that's uh, that's getting towards that you know heads-up display with with stereoscopic uh, image injection. Uh, that's that's really an advance as far as working this stuff into the workflow. Um, there's a problem of information overload. You know you're kind of looking at all this stuff and there may be more than you need to see. Particularly if you start to include tractography and this kind of stuff, it uh, it, it gets to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, there's a, a problem with 2D. 3D disconnect. So currently, uh, when I'm doing endoscopic augmented reality surgery, which all of my uh, endoscopic cases now are done with with AR, with heads-up display, the uh, the screen, our, our endoscope is 2D, and the image is projected in 2D, but both should really be in 3D uh, because if I want the the, the the, a 3D image on a 2D screen can be a little bit confusing, and it gives you kind of that uh, what they call you know uh, in, in unintentional blindness, like it's kind of showing you something that you may you know may be obscuring what you really need to see. Uh, there's a learning curve with this stuff. I mean, you saw the great lengths I took to learn how to use separate monocular vision. Uh, with the more uh, eyepiece injection on the microscope, uh, that's getting more intuitive. And with the, the uh, exoscopes and the endoscopes, it's, it's getting easier and easier because the image quality is getting better. Uh, and then finally, uh, data to support uh, improved outcomes. Uh, this is something that was going to take time to develop. Number one, I think the AR systems are nearly ready for uh, for prime time. There's a couple of tweaks that need to happen uh, in order to make them fully integrated, particularly for the microscopic cases. I think they're already there for the endoscope or exoscopic cases, but the, the microscope eyepiece injection is a key uh, feature that needs to be ready. Um, but as I said with earlier with navigation, you know, uh, it, it took years and years for to prove that intraoperative navigation was superior to doing a craniotomy based on Taylor Houghton lines. You know, like, well, you just draw lines in the skull and you know where your thumb is. And there's still people that do it that way. I mean, there's one surgeon at our institution that doesn't use navigation ever for any cases. It's mind blowing to me, you know, but uh, that, you know, there was a time we didn't have, you know, indoor water or power either. And, you know, that's the way some people still do it. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you have to weigh that. It's difficult because if you have a senior surgeon with tons of experience um, that is not using technology and a junior surgeon with less experience using technology and there's not an improved outcome, they're going to say that, okay, that the, the, you know, you don't, why spend a million dollars on this when the outcome isn't better? Well, if, if the outcome is to take junior surgeons, residents, fellows, junior attendings, and accelerate that learning curve so that they understand the 3D anatomy better, then we've achieved our goal. And my interest in this comes from my background was originally in anatomy with Shane Tubbs, your chief scientific officer here, and I kind of, you know, published and published and published with Shane and just kind of got the idea that you know, uh, surgery is anatomy, and your understanding of it is not just based on your textbook of anatomy, but the understanding of the anatomy in this individual patient. And if we can use technology to help residents in the modern era where oversight is increasingly complex and the ability to allow residents to learn on patients is, in, is decreasing, if we can use AR and VR to accelerate that learning curve and keep and keep developing top-notch surgeons and get them, you know, to the level where they're expert earlier. Uh, then I think that's real, where really where the value of this technology lies. Um, so I kind of had this, you know. Um, 
precision neurosurgery, you know, for specific, precisely planning the craniotomy, we're almost there, I think, for VR, uh, the, the planning phase is there, but still some advancements that need to happen for augmented reality. Um, but uh, these things are, are ongoing. That uh, this is a kind of, the Gardner does this annual hype cycle for developing technologies. And so um, a lot of the things you would have heard of, machine learning, artificial intelligence, are kind of, it goes, you know, this uh, excitation or, or innovation trigger, then there's inflated expectations, then there's kind of trough of disillusionment. So augmented reality uh, sits on the bottom of what we call the trough of disillusionment, where people's expectations for it to become real and you know fully implemented, it's not the technology isn't quite ready for it. This was in 2017. You can see in 2017 where VR was on this curve, so kind of coming out of that trough. And in 2018, Gardner published the same thing, and VR is now gone from the curve. Gardner interprets this as VR, virtual reality, now ready for widespread implementation uh, throughout all areas of medicine, including, as we said, Forbes, saying that it's the number one technology for healthcare experience. You can see AR still sitting here at the bottom of the curve. So there are some things that need, you know, the lens technology and the heads up aspects of the technology need to happen. But you can still, it's, uh, it's still ahead of blockchain and artificial intelligence and machine learning as far as pr you know, how close is it to being ready for adoption in neurosurgery and beyond. So. Um, um, I think this is very telling as far as kind of where we are and where we're going. And I expect that in the next year or two, uh, AR is going to become a lot more widely adopted uh, as the technology improves. And I cannot, uh, this is my little girl. Uh, I always show this at the end of my talks because it reminds me of why I do what I do. Um, she's my life. Uh, and I can take any questions that you guys have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lewis. You know, I think you really hit the nail on the head in terms of the use of these technologies for training and simulation before we unleash new surgeons on actual patients. And I think that, especially when you look at the restrictions in work hours, um, the decreased time of exposure, and how do you, how do you um, make up for, like you said, that, that lack of working nonstop for seven hours, um, one of the discussions and analogies I use is that when you're training an Olympic gymnast, uh, you know, Bella, what his, whatever his name is, doesn't say, okay, go work on the bars for three hours and let me know how it goes, right? <laughs> They're standing there watching, correcting in real time. They're looking at the tape afterwards and studying it. And, and to me, this is part of that. Um, and... It, it's just, like you said, it's a paradigm shift, but we're going to have to make sure that the next generation is somehow knowledgeable and trained to do these things, and I think this is a good example of doing it. I think the other thing is, is that once we kind of get over and out of that trough of disillusionment and we refine the technology, this really is going to improve the consistency and decrease the variability of operations between surgeons, right? A lot of what we see in terms of expert surgeons right now is they've made enough mistakes to know not to do something or not to pull on something or not to reach around a certain corner. And this overcomes that hurdle so that regardless of whether you're doing the surgery or I'm doing the surgery or Dan's doing the surgery, they're getting a consistently good product. And that's that's I, I, particularly the value, I think, of that because, it, you know, when I show these cases and they're like, well, I would have known, you know, that you wouldn't have been able to do it that way. I wouldn't have planned that operation. I'm like, well, yeah, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback. And it's particularly easy for people that have been doing it for 25 years. But uh, in me, the VR rehearsal saves me again and again from, you know, doing sometimes an incorrect or suboptimal approach. It, it lets me decide based on trying it out. Am I going to get the line of sight I need? Am I going to get the surgical view I need? And so that's uh, for younger surgeons, including not just residents, but you know, I've been in practice for five years now, and I still use it to rehearse it every, for every case because I, you know, I want to know that is the plan that I, you know, selected going to be the right one for this patient. Right. Any comments or questions for the audience? What's your kind of workflow, and how much effort is there into processing like the DICOM images? to that 3D model and then and then doing the plan? Is there a tech that helps you? Is there someone from industry or are you doing it yourself? Uh, there's a, there's a, a tech that helps out with, with the case reconstruction. It's called segmentation, taking the diagonals and making the 3D images. Um, for CT and CT angiogram, this, it's a one click, it's auto segmented. So there's like 10 different views, like you know whether I want to see the aneurysm in pink or, or the vessels highlighted in white, you can choose whichever model you want. 
Um, so there's a bunch of those for CT. Uh, for MRI, you're getting closer to augment, augment, uh, excuse me, auto segmentation, but it takes about 10 or 15 minutes for the tech to build the case, uh, to construct it. Um, for the for the VR models, and then those are the same models that are carried into the AR system. So um, that's doesn't interrupt my workflow at all. What does uh, you know change a little bit as far as the patient engagement aspect of the workflow is they come in, you know, and instead of just sitting there and having a normal consultation talk about surgery, they, we then put them through a VR fly through of their operation. And so uh, that you know, although it adds to the time that I spend with the patients. Number one, it greatly improves their understanding and satisfaction, and it pays huge dividends in patient retention, as you saw. I mean, you know, I, I, losing only now 4% of my patients to UCLA and Cedars is awesome, and I, I attribute it solely to the fact that these patients feel more engaged because they get a VR rehearsal. So there's a little bit of time out of my standpoint to go through with them, but you know, it, 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 I think it kind of balances out because those patients, you know, once they've seen that, they get it. Uh, they understand that, you know what the plan is, and like I said, it's oddly common that they're like, "All right, cool, let's do this." You know, like they get excited about it because they see the model and they get the plan. All right, I want to thank everybody. We we had a tremendous set of guest speakers who've traveled from near and far, so thank you to them. I want to thank again our industry sponsors for making this course possible. I want to thank the uh, Seattle Science Foundation and their staff for helping us seamlessly execute yet again another course, which uh, we, it would have been very difficult to, to do what we did without them. And enjoy your weekend, everybody. Thank you for your attention today.